but you know, Calabria is uh, not just for me, I think, not just because I'm Calabrian, it's one of the most beautiful places in the world. <coughs> and uh, it is very particular because uh, in Calabria you find everything, any kind of uh, scenery, any kind of fruits, any kind of vegetables. It looks like if uh, the whole world is, co is concentrated in few kilometers. You know, there is a, a story that my grandmother used to tell me when I was a, a child, before going to bed. She was telling me this story over and over, always the same. And I, and I was asking her as well for the same story. And that was about the creation of uh, Calabria, how Calabria was created, you know, by God. You know, it started with the creation of the world, that God took uh, six days to create the world. Then uh, the seventh day, he took a rest. And the day after, the eighth day, when he woke up, he realized that he had uh, forgotten Calabria, you know? And because <laughs> he had already used all the matter available to create the, the, the universe, so he decided to take a little piece from each one of the five continents and put them together. And so Calabria was born, was created. And actually in Calabria you find, I mean, uh, in few kilometers, you go from the coast, maybe from a place that could uh, look like a California, you go up to the mountains. In a few kilometers, you reach the Sila Mountains in the middle of the, the region that looks like Canada, with valleys, forests, lakes, and everything else. Then you go to the other side, and you end up in Mexico, in a place that looks like Mexico, with the, the cactus, you know, dry land and beaches, you know. So that's why it's fantastic. And also you find, as I told you, any kind of fruits here. Any kind, any kind of fruits, even the ones that you would imagine to find here. For example, the citron. The citron, the, the etrog, basically, what the Jewish call etrog. The best variety of citron grow in the world grows here in Calabria in northwest of Calabria. And that variety of citron was brought over to Calabria by the Jewish 2,000 years ago, for example. Then we have the bergamot. You know the bergamot? It's a citrus fruit, citrus fruit. That is a natural mutation. It's, it, looks, it looks like a, a grapefruit when it is ripe, it's yellow. But it is not a grapefruit. It's not a, a cross. It is not even a cross between an orange and a lemon. It's another kind of fruit. 98% of the worldwide production takes place here in Calabria because the only other place where you can grow the bergamot is the island of Cyprus. And a small percentage is grown there. The rest here, all around the, the, in the province of Reggio Calabria, because you can grow bergamot only there. I mean, if you can plant it the, in another place, even in Catanzaro. If I plant the bergamot in Catanzaro, I would have the plant, but I wouldn't have fruits. It's very strange. You know, it grows wow. in a very limited area, only 100 kilometers of coast. You know, in this little stretch of coast. <laughs> you can grow bergamot. It's unbelievable. It is used for everything, for perfumes, but now they use it as well to flavor cakes or sweets or um, uh, cookies. But it has always been the main ingredient for the early grey tea, the English tea. The early, early you know, the early gray tea, mm -hmm. it's made with bergamot. So, uh, but going there and particularly visiting the church was really an incredible experience. I mean, it was just uh, mind boggling. And um, my cousin Alessandro, he speaks very good English. And he wanted to, uh, 
he wanted to uh, me to go in the church and meet the, the priest and get as much information I had. And he was actually like a little aggressive. He's like knocking on the door, <laughs> knocking on the door. You know, finally, I see I was waiting in the background. Finally, I see this priest come out. The priest is a young guy like him, you know, in his 30s. They're pointing over to me, you know, uh, crazy. So finally, the priest says, OK, come in. So I go in. We sit down with the priest uh, in his office and and Alessandro's trying to get like he wants to go through like all the books and do research. And I said, Alessandro, I have all this information already. I have everything. So we don't need to bother the, the priest with this. So anyway, but the church is uh, over a thousand years old and it, it's been added on to but like the original mm. building is over a thousand years old and if you look at the side of the, the church on one of the walls they have the names of all the uh uh many of my relatives but the people who died in world war one and world war two the names are on the side of the church and they're all names that i recognize whether these were verdicchio people or ronchella which was another name that married into the family and so I'm seeing all these names. It's really incredible. I had such a, an extensive family in this little village. And uh, the priest said to me, um, you know, uh, uh, this is, you know, where your family comes from. So this is a really uh, amazing story that I'm going to tell you now. So I'm sitting in front of the priest. And I look up to the right on this adjacent wall. And he has a, a, a cross a crucifix and it's unlike any crucifix that you would typically see there's no body of christ on the crucifix it's just like an inlaid crucifix as a matter of fact maybe i can th this is actually the the crucifix here so you can see looking at this it's very unusual right mm -hmm. i mean it's, yeah it's like gold leaf it's got you know all this like inlay in it um so I had bought this uh, crucifix in Italy when we were in Venice several years ago. And I think it was made, it was made in, no, no, I bought it in Amalfi, but I think it was made in the Murano uh, factory. So now we're very far away from where I bought this church, like uh, where I bought the crucifix, like hundreds of miles away in this little church in the middle of nowhere. So. And this is the only crucifix that I have in my entire house, hanging up in my dining room. So I look up at that wall on the right-hand side. He has the identical crucifix. Mm -hmm. Not similar, identical. I took a photo of it, all the colors, everything. So I told the priest the story, and you know, tears came to my eyes because I thought this was really an incredible coincidence and this is one in millions or billions i mean this is crazy so the priest without without uh missing a beat he said to me he goes of course he goes who do you think brought you here why mm. do you think you're here he goes god brought you here and he's just giving you a sign and that was such a meaningful experience for me so you know when did you get started with researching uh, the family when did you get the bug well it was and this is where i told you it's an interesting story because i never knew anything about my family history nobody in my family knew anything about the family history and what happened was is when i was 21 um I, i'm also from new jersey by the way i, oh, I grew good. up I, I grew up in woodbridge not too far from you and my father passed away when i was 21 from cancer and at his funeral um, was his uncle, my great uncle, uh, Uncle Billy, as we called him. And Uncle Billy, I said to him, I go, what do you know about the family? What, I mean, do you know anything about where the Fatarosis came from? And he said, very little, Michael. He goes, you know, all I know is that they were from a wealthier family and they were a lot of artists and musicians. And I think they were from a town called Grignano. So I took out a little like napkin and I wrote down Grignano on it and I had him spell it and I put it in my pocket and I forgot about it. And I just kept the napkin, you know, tucked away in my house. Maybe someday I would do anything with it. I didn't know. And fast forward about uh, 12, 13 years, uh, I'm in Italy with my first wife. 
and she had planned a trip for us to kind of do the the Italy, you know, down the boot kind of trip. We started in Venice and then we went to Florence and then we did Rome. And then <clears throat> she put uh, Positano as the last part of the trip. And so we're sitting in the hotel room in Positano and it's raining. And it's, we only have like three or four days in Positano and she's really mad because, you know, there's nothing to do. So I'm sitting there and I'm looking at the like local magazines that, you know, you get in every hotel room. They always put out these books and these magazines. So I'm just flipping through them and there's a map of the area. And on the map, it says Grignano. And I'm like, what? We, I, and literally when you look at on the map, Grignano and, and Positano are so close. The only problem is there's a mountain range between them. So to get to Grignano, you have to go all the way around the Sorrento Peninsula and then mm. come back inland. But I didn't know that. So I'm like, look how close we are. We're <laughs> like, it's right there. I have to go. And she's like, no, tomorrow's supposed to be nice. We're, we have to go to Capri. We haven't seen Capri. I'm like, I'm this close to the town that my family is from. I have to go there. And we argued all night. So the next morning we wake up and I had to hire a driver who also spoke English. And so I hired a driver and she's telling me, oh, this is a waste of time. You're not gonna find anything. We should be spending the last day of our vacation in Capri. And I was like, listen, if you wanna go to Capri, here's some money, take a boat. It takes you right to Capri, have a nice lunch, do your shopping. I'm doing this for me, I have to do this. So she's like, no, no, I'm gonna come. And I'm just like, oh, this is going to be such a horrendous trip for me because, <laughs> you know, in my ear, the whole I told you you weren't going to find anything. I told you this was a waste of time. So the driver goes, where do you want to go? And I said, Grignano. And he looks at me because Positano is absolutely beautiful. I mean, it's like one of the most picturesque places in Italy. And Grignano is kind of run down. It's 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 you know, it's a real Italian city. It's not tourism. They don't have tourists there. And. Uh, it's what real Italy is. And so he goes, why do you want to leave Positano and go to Grignano? I said, family research. He goes, oh, okay, I understand. So then we're driving, and, he, and for some reason he goes, you know, instead of going to Grignano, why don't we go to Lettity? I said, Lettity? He goes, yeah, Lettity. It's an older town. It's further up the mountain, but they'll have older records. And, and for whatever reason, I said, okay. And I'm not usually a guy that says, okay, when you're changing my plans. Like, I, I don't know why I said, okay. I, I still, to this day, if you had to ask me again, a thousand times out of a thousand times, I would have said, no, let's go to Grignano. This time I said, yes. So we drive up to Lettity and we stop at the little uh, town hall, the, the, the uh, mun municipal hall. And he goes inside and we go inside and he tells the guy behind the desk, like, oh, I've got Americans here. They're doing family research. So the guy behind the desk goes, okay, well, what's the last name? And he goes, Fattarosi. The guy looks and he like looks around my driver and kind of points to me. And he goes, Fattarosi. He goes, "See, sí, Fattarosi. He goes, no, no, no. Go across the street to the cathedral. They have older records. Okay. So we walk across the street to the cathedral. We walk inside. The priest comes out. Now this time the priest looks at me and goes, Passaporto, Passaporto. So I give him my passport and he goes, Fattarosi. So he takes me off to the side and on a big plaque, there are all these names of the bishops of Lettity since the 900s through, I think, the 1800s when they lost the bishop seat. And in 1428 to 1440 is the name Factorosa. Factoro and I said, no, 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 not Factorosa, Fattorosi. And he goes, no, 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 same family, just a change in spelling. I said, really? He goes, yes. And I said, a Fatarosi was bishop of this cathedral? And he goes, no, no, not this cathedral, the old cathedral. So then he walks me outside and across the way, you could see it from, the, from this cathedral is an old castle, a huge old Norman castle in Lettity. And next to that is the ruins of the old cathedral that date back to the year 1000. And they stopped using that cathedral in about the 15 or 1600s. And so my ancestor, well, not ancestor, because he probably didn't have children, but someone in the Fatorosi family was Bishop of Lettity between 1400, I mean, 1428 and 1440. And then he takes me around to another plaque and another plaque on the wall in one of the little alcoves. And it's dedicated to Michael Fatorosius. 
spelled the old Latin way. Spell Latin, yeah. And Michael, and I'm like, you know, oh my God. <laughs> and I'm like, this is, and he's like, well, Michael is buried below the church. This used to be over his body, but because it had been walked on so much, it was removed from the floor and put on the wall. And that was dated like 1704. So now I'm like, oh my God. And he goes, well, wait here for a minute. He walks down, Steve, he walks out to the, to the priest's little office and he brings back a book. So he walks upstairs and he brings back this book. Okay. And this is basically the history of the churches in Letity. It was written in 1978 by a priest. And so I start, I start, you know, thumbing through the book until I get to this page, which I don't know if you can see it, but yeah. it's, it's a family tree sort of, of the Fatorosi and the Fatorosi de Barnaba families from 1428 to 1891, which is when my great grandfather left and came to America. But he comes back to so Bali in 1920. And he meets another stone carver and the stone carver's name is Alfonso Scaffa. And Scaffa says, you have talent. I work for the great sculptor Gutson Borglum who has a studio in Stamford, Connecticut. I want you to meet him. So he brings Luigi to meet Borglum in Stamford, Connecticut. And Borglum is just blown away with my grandfather's ability. And he says, I want you to quit your job in Barry, Vermont, live on my estate so you could work in the studio with me every day and you will be my expert in granite and marble. And uh, Luigi is not gonna pass up this opportunity to work for a world renowned sculptor. So he, uh, in the meantime, Alfonso who lives in Port Chester, which is like 15 minutes South from Stanford, um, says, I want you to come and meet my family. So he brings Luigi down there and he introduces him to his sister-in-law, who's this little beauty from a brood cell named Nicoletta Cartarelli. My grandfather falls in love. You know, she returns in kind. And so Alfonso Scaffa not only introduces Luigi to Guts and Borglum, but to my grandmother. And that's why I'm here. So wow. Luigi <laughs> ends up living on Borglum's estate with my grandmother their, for their first year of their marriage. And then he ends up settling in Port Chester. And that's where the, why the Del Biancos are all, all from Port Chester in, in this part of New York. Uh, yeah, that's 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 neat. And and I didn't realize that Borglum that he did uh, Stone Mountain. He did. He did do Stone Mar Mountain. Um, in fact, my grandfather was his chief carver at the beginning of that project. Borglum never completed it. In fact, he just started. It's a really kind of a complicated story. And it's one of the reasons why he has a reputation of being a white supremacist because people um, thought he was a member of the KKK. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah, um, long story short, uh, the daughters of the Confederacy approached Borglum about creating a bas relief of the leaders of the Confederacy on the side of this mountain. And this had never been done before. And Borglum was all about that kind of like, I want to do something bigger, bolder, you know, never been mm -hmm. done before. So he takes the project on, but doesn't realize that the silent partners of the, um, well, I don't know how silent they were, but the, the daughters of the Confederacy were also being funded by the KKK. So Borglum um, decides that he, uh, has to, I guess has to, you know, kind of rub shoulders with the KKK because they're paying him to do this work. So I don't know if he became a card carrying member, but obviously he has his association with them. But the KKK starts making more demands. They want a tableau added to the Confederacy statues of a slave on his knees, thanking his master for giving him a good life. Can you imagine? And Borglum... I don't know, Borglum, whether he doesn't want to do that for artistic reasons um, or whether he uh, is morally against that. I don't know. But he he smashes the models. He says, I'm not doing this project. I'm out of here. And the, the, the KKK sends the police after him and he's on a high speed chase in the middle of the night. With the little son. Wow. I don't know if Luigi was with him because he had Luigi down there uh, working with him. My grandfather never talked about it. And he leaves Georgia and Don Robinson, the state historian who's looking to create something to attack tourism in South Dakota reads about the story. And he says, this is the kind of guy I need to do my mountain sculpture. And that's how he finds out about Borglum and eventually hires Borglum to do Mount Rushmore. When Mount Rushmore was first started, was your grandfather involved from the outset or, or he brought him in later on? A good question. Uh, 
Mount Rushmore started in 1927 and it moved very slowly. The carving moved very slowly. And by 1933, the head of Washington was about three quarters of the way done. And Borglum realized um, you know, that most of the men working on the mountain were unemployed miners that had no work during the depression. And he hired them because the, um, the money coming in from the government was now coming in during the depression and funding was really limited and Borglum had a, Borglum had a really hard time getting classically trained stone carvers because number one, he needed somebody, people that were physically strong because this was really demanding yeah. work. Two, you couldn't be afraid of heights. And three, you had to be able to carve on such a grand scale and to be able to adapt the perspective. You know, imagine carving and finishing eyes and making sure that from a thousand feet away, 5,000 feet away, that it looks, you know, mm -hmm. real convincing. Yeah. And you're, you're, you have no sense of, you know, you're carving a bust. You could carve, you could step away three feet, but how do you step away a mile every time you carve? And, and so he needed somebody with that ability and he didn't have any trained hands to do that. And my grandfather had already been working for Borglum all throughout the twenties. And that's when he realized I need, I need somebody with uh, Luigi's ability. Um, so he hires him in 33 to be the chief. Carver. So and we come from similar backgrounds. Uh, I am a, an Italian boy from Queens. I think I have, <laughs> I think I have a couple of years on you maybe. Uh, well, maybe I have a lot of years on you, but um, nah. <laughs> uh, it, it was so exciting when I was, you know, reviewing before the show and seeing how you do the things with the family, because I come from, one very crazy Italian family and one not so crazy. So yeah. uh, the first thing I want to ask you is you, you're probably doing what all us crazy Italians would love to do and think we should do is talk about our family. So how did you start all of this? <laughs> we all talk about our families, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> um, for me, it was uh, something that I've always knew I wanted to do. I always wanted to create a one person show in sort of that genre where you're impersonating characters and there's music because I sing as well. And it sort of feels as if it could be a traditional, you know, Broadway show to a stand up act. And I wanted to sort of combine all of those elements together because um, that's a little bit of what I do. I wouldn't say I'm just a stand up comedian and or I'm just a theater actor. I wanted to like m mush it all together into one fun night. And then, of course, why else or what else would I talk about um, would be my family, because growing up in an Italian family, you impersonate everyone as a kid. That's what we did. We made fun of each other. We poked fun. We impersonated someone. I mean, my family still does that. We tease a lot. So growing up in a family like that, I always knew that if I was going to write a show, my first show out of the gate would be something that would be near and dear to me because it's so easy, right? Like yeah. impersonating these family members <laughs> are so easy because you've been doing it your whole life. So for me, it was like, that's the story I want to tell. And then you have to sort of sit down and say how to craft the story. So for me, it was I knew I wanted to tell it with my grandmother as the forefront because she was such a specific human. I mean, I've never met anyone as unique as her. Um, she is not a, tra a traditional Italian grandmother. You know, we always think of those grandmothers with those house dresses, ugly orthopedic shoes and rollers in their hair. And that was not my grandmother on my father's side at all. My she was a complete different human that I've ever witnessed. I mean, she wore sexy dresses and spike heels and cigarettes and and she always looked like a model coming out of like a 1960s catalog up until God, up until her death, to be quite honest with you. So it was sort of that energy of just, I've never seen anyone like that. And we didn't even call her grandma. We called her Franny. So it was, <laughs> it was a definite different feel because my other grandma, my mother's mother was like a this little angel who cooked over a stove for thousands of us and, and always wore the house dresses. So a very different energy. But I, I knew if I was going to do a show, I was going to write it in the vein of the Franny character. <laughs> and that's, that's, that's neat. Um, and your grandmother is probably the same age that my mom and my aunts would be. Um, they would all be, if unfortunately none are left, but if they were left, they'd all be in their nineties, close to a hundred by now. Yeah, um, my grandmother, I think she'd be 88. Yeah, yeah, something like that. She'd be yeah. today. I have cousins that are eighty-eight, so there you see how old I am. <laughs> oh, I, I get it. We it, big Italian family. <laughs> um, when my grandfather passed away, I, he he died when I was like two months old. She wore black from the day he died until 
the day she died. Oh, goodness. Oh, My goodness. mom's mom wore the black dress for three days and then went back to the Vestalia and that was it. You know, she was just, you know, grandma again. And the old Italian ladies didn't like that, you know, and she yeah. said, eh, what am I going to do? You know? Right. I mean, my grandmother, um, it's actually quite odd that I'm going to tell the story, but my grandmother, I used to spend time with her. She lived on Ocean Parkway in Brooklyn. And I remember spending a day with her and she said, we have to, you know, I have to do errands. And we had to go to a funeral of a friend. <laughs> and I, I was maybe seven or eight. That was an errand. That was an errand. And she <laughs> took me on the date to the funeral and she wore this red, sparkly dress, um, very tight fitting to a funeral. And I remember everyone being in black and I thought, she looks odd. We're dressed in regular clothes and she's got this bright red outfit on. And I remember asking her later, I was like, why, you know, everyone was in black. Why weren't we in black? She goes, why were they in black? And I was like, <laughs> all right. And that was her answer. Her answer was like, why do we have to be in black? Like there was no, um, there was no re real reason to her to wear black. Um, and it wasn't honoring or dishonoring in her eyes. It was just, this is what I want to wear. <laughs> so we went. Yeah. Well, growing up in the fifties and, and early sixties, Funerals were just that was that was a way of life in the Italian family. Yeah, you know, yeah, of course, it of went course. for three days, morning and night. Yeah, back, we're back. screaming over the casket. It, oh. I know. Trust me, I know. We're all there. So I, I've been to those as a child, and I'm like, oh, very dramatic these are. Uh, but we ate well because in between everybody went back to my grandmother's and, and, and ate. And and uh, they were they only lived like three blocks from the funeral home. So, the, you know, we would sit on the chairs from the funeral home and, and, and all that. Yeah, they knew a guy. That's my dad. Uh, yes, so absolutely. Guy. Absolutely. A lady comes um, out on the alley and, and asks, you know, was actually wondering who, who, who these guys were. And this is one of the things I hit the most. When I on the streets in Italy and I got to talk to clients on the phone, sending voicemails or WhatsApp to my project coordinator, Jeanette, or Justin, my U.S. manager uh, that we have in Connecticut as well. Well, I speak English on the street and people just turn around at me and, you know, wonder who the alien is <laughs> that's talking this alien language. But so the lady did the same thing when we were on the tour and she came up with a huge key in her hands, like as, as though she had done his own purpose, but there's no purpose thing. She just brought this key out of her pocket. I had no idea where it came out of her pants or skirt. And she took us to church that I had no idea existed because it was not a parish church. It was just a little chapel church if you will, uh, no chapels like Vegas has, but a chapel. And Lucy, St. Lucy's. Well, remember this, St. Lucy thing goes, St. Lucy is the protector of sight, you know, for your eyes and all for mm -hmm. those who believe. You hail St. Lucy for that you can protect your eyes. Well, sure thing, there were ex votos, I'm not sure how you guys call it in English, but ex votos is sort of a piece of, you know, metal made or wood made item or I shouldn't say souvenir, but it's more of like, a comm commemorating piece of, uh, mm, you know, I, I, of course now I'm struggling, but, you know, something that you do to worship the saint in favor of, well, for the favors that he or she gave for whatever miracle that you believe he or she made happen for you. Mm -hmm. Well, sure, sure indeed, there were tons of these pieces and items and objects at the feet of St. Lisa's statue. That's why I'm really focusing on this San Luis day because it was all about eyes, eyes, uh, uh, pieces of eyes, nice carved in stone or metal. Well, the first and only one that a client picked up from, from the feet of the statue was a uh, metal made. And the story goes, the tradition goes, well, actually the lady said, you got to approach it through your eyes, just kind of hiding your eyes and have whoever's taking a picture, you know, being, being your picture taker, just take a shot. And so you can protect yourself from that moment. You know, it's kind of a traditional thing. Sure thing it did. But then after the picture was taken, I still remember this, uh, you know, got, of course, for those who listen to this, not watching, it's going to be not good, but I'm, I'm going to show this on video. Got this off his eyes and shouted in the middle of the chat. I was like, what's going on? And he, and he goes, you won't believe this. His great, great grandparents' names were on it. He had wow. picked up among all the others. He had picked up a metal made ex photo that his great grandparents, great great grandparents, had sent off to Italy from America, Connecticut. In because what they wanted to do is you guys sell this item and you make money to repair the church. That was the whole thing. But I never knew that it was never, you know, fused. It was never melted down to make money or whatever. It was 
you know, drop there at a statue after a hundred or more years, the same part, a, a member of that same family came back and picked it up just, just that by chance. I mean, there's no, no purposeful surprise. It was, it was a whole thing that was meant to happen. It, it was great. Small town was yeah. as well, but in Abruzzo and it's called Bunyada and it's outside of a bigger city called Sumona and Sumona has something that it's what very well known for. It is the city of the confetti, the uh, uh, almond, the uh, uh, candy coated almonds that they give out at the weddings. Really? So Sumona, ah. yes, Sumona is like the capital of the of where they make confetti, and they sell them all over the world. So uh, yeah, two different uh, two different regions. They're uh, proud of both. And uh, now, and as soon I, as as soon as you said confetti, I knew what you meant, right? Exactly. But, but, yeah. but no, the young I, kids I, probably were thinking about you know confetti. <laughs> you're a hundred percent right. I don't even know if uh, you know back. I think in the day confetti were like a staple at, yes. at weddings. Mm -hmm. I don't think they are as much now. Although it's still, I mean, they're they're still sold, like I said. But I don't think it's as so popular. I want to start shooting at six o'clock in the morning because I'm a crazy person. We're American or Sicilian American, and you know I like to get it going. It's it's going to be hot. It's going to be. It was like 120 degrees there the first day I was there. I was like, wow. So I said to the guys, I said we got to be here early. We got to be here by you know eight o'clock, whatever. You're looking at me like I'm crazy. Eight o'clock. You know they want they want to show up at noon, have their espresso, then show up, and this is what was happening. And I would say, guys. You know, and then we would have these long lunches because they didn't want to work or they didn't want to work, poor, you know, past five or six hours. But uh, on several occasions, uh, I'd be waiting and they would be late. I'd have to get them their espresso to get them in the right frame of mind. And then once we got going, we did well, but we had to get them going. And now understand this. None of them understand English. So I'm speaking to a crew that totally looks at me like I have three heads. So now I have a guy with me who's a translator who's actually in the film with me. Uh, he translates everything. So it's hilarious. It's like, I'm saying it to him. He's saying it to them. They're saying it back to him and he's saying it to me. <laughs> and we're shooting this movie. And, uh, I, you know, even though we didn't understand each other, we kind of understood each other. Because there was so much uh, passion in it and so much love in it. And so much, I thought they, I mean, my feelings were is that they had a lot of respect for me because I was coming to a place and representing them in a, in, a, in a very, very deep way, in an honest way. And I think they really, really respected that about me. But I also was so honored that they, they uh, embraced me as one of their own. Um, and that was very special. But I remember also another funny story was, um, I'll just, you know, we were, doing, we were doing a scene and it was like a long scene. And, you know, I had a close up and I was like, okay, guys, da da da. You know, and I tell the guy, give him whatever, just make sure the camera's here, whatever. So we action it, action it, and I'm doing the scene and I'm into it. You know, I'm just a whole the whole thing. And I'm listening, I'm doing the whole thing, and you know, it's all all the cameras, blah, blah, blah. and and they were looking at me like, you know, and I'm starting to realize like, why are they just like sitting there, like kind of just sitting there, like you know, just like looking around, like not even they're not holding the cameras, and I'm starting to think what the so then finally I finished the sequence and we're sitting there and I go, all right, cut. And the guy looks at me, and goes, cut. We know roll. I said, what do you mean? He goes, we don't put camera on yet. I see. You know, so the whole scene I was doing, they didn't have the camera on. And who, who am I going to blame? I blame myself. I said, it's my fault. So I did it wrong. You know, but they don't understand sometimes. You know, it's just, uh, but that's what makes it kind of, there's a funny, funniness to it and a, and a, a, a nuance to it because you, you try to like explain it to them. I mean, there was days that we were doing a sequence, and I'm like, no, no, no. I remember this lady, Maria. She's so sweet. I said, Maria, no, no, no. All I need is you to do this. Okay. Action. And she would do the total option. No, no, Maria. Maria, do this. Okay, no problem. Again, we must have did it 35 times. And she finally... <laughs> I, <laughs> but you know what? They were lovely. And I wouldn't trade that experience for anything I've ever done in Hollywood anything I've done anywhere, the love and the friendships and the respect and the honor and the laughs and the cries were spectacular. So I have to ask you, uh, because we think we eat Italian food, uh, 
and um, what's the biggest differences between Italian food in Italy and Italian food here? <laughs> um, maybe you guys mix too much. Uh, <laughs> one way. Uh, because, for instance, um, uh, spaghetti meatballs. Uh, actually, in Italy, we eat spaghetti and then we, we eat meatballs because it's the first course and the second course. Uh, and so this is um, because uh, I, the, the main difference that I notice here is that um, and this reflects your being American as well, Americans as well, uh, is that you you tend to uh, to put in the same plate uh, all the different parts of a meal and because it's just uh, the way you usually do and so but and each se uh, separately um, taken they are each uh, originally Italian for, uh, meals because spaghetti is spaghetti and Italy is uh, Italian and also the meatballs and so just this is one of the examples that comes to my mind uh but yes uh, and also also this um kind of mixing uh ingredients uh, like is chicken parmigiana for instance which is not italian mm -hmm. a, a traditional recipe but i also know that uh, back in the days um people who went what to cook um, didn't find all the ingredients they need to in order to, to to cook the recipe as the in the traditional way and so they they they, they try to invent something uh, with yeah. what they had at hand and so uh, uh, as we Italians are very creative creative uh, so uh, all these uh, kind of Italian American recipes uh, were born, but I like them. Uh, I like to to try everything.